You work for the Open Society Foundation in London. When did you first um, get involved in the Treaty for the Blind? Well, I think there is a story before the Treaty for the Blind, and that's really the sort of campaign to reform WIPO and open up WIPO to civil society and the public interest. And I think um, it was when I first met you, Jamie, I think, in 2003. And I think we had a conversation somewhere at a conference and um, you mentioned that you're thinking about the project and you labeled it the takeover of WIPO. <laughs> And I'm like, what's WIPO? <laughs> and you explained to me, it's the UN agency reforming intellectual property uh, law. And um, so, you know, we looked into a bit more closely um, as a foundation and very quickly realized that um, intellectual property, but also specifically copyright law, um, is not currently serving the public interest. And so that's when we set out to develop sort of a strategy that would help uh, civil society to get engaged uh, with WIPO specifically and try and reform these laws that govern how we, um, you know, access and reuse knowledge. Does this treaty for the blind, is it, is it one of the more concrete things you've seen come out of this reform of WIPO? Yeah, I think it's the it's probably the most concrete and also the most important thing in my view and uh, the reason is the first really really important reason is because it's a major success for blind people and I think it will make a big difference in their lives that's what World Blind Union and all their members they're telling us today have told us yesterday that they got out of this agreement more than they could have dreamed and I think it will solve a lot of their problems and it will finally enable blind people, visually impaired, print disabled people to more fully participate in shaping their societies and that is a very important open society value that everybody has that ability and I think that treaty greatly contributes that. But I think the treaty is also very very important for a second reason that's um, for copyright. I think it's, it's a revolution for copyright for international copyright and the reason is because this is the first agreement that puts users rights first and actually mandates globally the protection of user rights in copyright and I think that's a first it has not been done before and that's why I think it's 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 really really important and I think possibly a third reason is that a lot of campaigns that I'm involved involved with and I'm able to support being part of the Open Society Foundations uh, are about damage control, right? ACTA was one example, the anti-counterfeit trade agreement, but I'm also working on free expression and privacy and a lot is damage control. And I think this agreement is different, right? It is civil society coming together and saying, this is what we want, not saying this is what we don't want, but this is what we want. And achieving, you know, over the course of several years to actually get that adopted as international binding law. And I think that is quite um, astounding and makes me very, very happy and proud of all the many people that have worked so hard on this agreement for many years. Um, and yeah, it's, I think, just wonderful. <laughs> I'd like to ask you uh, quickly about some of the people that were involved in this project get your uh, comments on what would be uh, Raul Cherna from India? Yes, I think this is a very, very important moment to remember Raul. Um, I remember him very vividly because he was, for all these years, since the agreement was first drafted in 2008, uh, it was July 2008 in the KI office in Washington DC, that's where I first met Rahul from India from Inclusive Planet and he immediately struck me as a very, very passionate, committed activist, not just for the visually impaired, I think for the disa disa disability community, generally speaking, and since that moment, since 2008, he was with us and relentlessly advocated with us on this treaty 
together with the Indian government, who by the way I also would want to compliment because they played an outstanding role throughout this agreement. And so I think this is an important time to remember Rahul and really his commitment. I think he would have been very, very proud of his and the other people's achievements uh, at this very moment. But I think there were other people as well. I think um, the um, blind community was very important, World Blind Union, and its member in sort of um, believing in this agreement and being committed throughout the process. Um, and I think what, why it worked and why we're here today is because the community of the blind uh, who had asked for such a solution for many, many years, actually decades, uh, in 2008 met the community of uh, copyright reformers. That is Knowledge Ecology International, but many other NGOs that sort of are here to rebalance copyright law and make it sort of um, a fairer deal uh, for everybody, including the public interest. And I think these two communities coming together in 2008 really uh, is the reason why we're here today. I think that was really, really important. And it's hard to name everybody you know, who was involved. There were so many on the EU front, David Hammerstein from TACD, with Dan Pascod in, in the US, KAI was certainly very, very important, but around the world, it was really, I think, a collective effort, and that's, that was great. And I was very impressed by, you know, while it was sometimes hard, um, sort of to keep the coalition together. I think we can be open about that. I was very, very impressed um, uh, because of how the community here in Marrakesh over these past 10 days has worked brilliantly together. So how different parts of the coalition have taken the lead on different parts of the treaty and, and how it all has come together in the end. I think it, was, it worked really, really well. I was going to go ahead and, and, and throw out some names and get your kind of. Uh, you can, yes, I, I of course. Pretty... I'm just going to give a name and I'm going to ask you to kind of give a, an impression of Yes. Louis Milron. Louis is one of our heroes, I think. Um, and the reason is that, you know, I think he believed in this project and in the broader copyright reform agenda from the very beginning. And he was passionate and committed as a government official, equally passionate and committed once he sort of left government and joined civil society. And I think he was one of the most instrumental people in this agreement. Also, I think um, very much helping civil society to understand what was happening in the negotiations. And I think that was really, really important. So I think he, he made a tremendous difference in this process. And I hope he will continue to make a tremendous difference uh, going forward because the job is not done. So we have other plans for reform. Uh, the Center for Internet and Society. Um, I'm a big, big fan of CIS. I should, uh, for disclosure purposes, say that uh, Sunil Abraham, the director of CIS, is actually my board member. <laughs> um, CIS was represented in these negotiations by Pranesh. He's, again, endlessly committed and I think technically very, very strong. And that, that was important in these negotiations because you needed to sort of make the case and be present, but, you know, and pressure governments by just your presence, but equally be very strong on the technical details. And I think Pranesh and CIS added a lot to that. So that was just really incredibly important. Within your own foundation, uh, were there people in the foundation that uh, were particularly supportive of your work on this? I'm very, very grateful to the Open Society Foundations. Um, uh, first of all, to my director, Darius Truplinskas, who sort of, you know, supported this project all along and gave me sort of support throughout this process, but also very importantly to the board, my board, the Information Program Board, which includes brilliant people such as Michael Geis, Sunil Abraham and others who are great activists themselves and really, really believed in this project. And that was very important. It allowed me to support civil society who worked on this change. Uh, but also I think um, I really, really appreciate that the Open Society Foundations always was able to shield themselves from corporate influence. Copyright is a very contentious issue, uh, 
political, politically contentious. And I don't think um, uh, it's, n it, it's necessarily normal to expect that you don't have any corporate influence, you know, or corporate pressure being exercised on you as a foundation. But I can confirm that thanks to the leadership, our president, the global board, I never had to deal with corporate pressure. And we could, you know, press ahead with supporting the best people in the copyright field. And, and that's, I think, in part why we're here today. So I'm just endlessly grateful that they gave me that space. How did you feel last night? With I would like to sort of also speak about KI very briefly. <laughs> James Love, Manon, Thiru, uh, and all the others. Uh, because I believe uh, KI and Jamie really were the first people that I at least met that had the vision for this treaty. So uh, they said, and you Jamie said, this is something that needs to happen for moral reasons and this is something that can happen politically if we play it right. And um, you convinced me. <laughs> and so this is why I was committed throughout these years and, and, and I always from the first moment believed in this project but it's very much thanks to you laying out that vision and, and making others believe in it, including myself. So thanks for that. Could, could you speak uh, briefly about, I know Mano isn't here this week, but about her, her early role in the I always felt that Mano had um, uh, a really important role on the copyright sort of activities of KI. And so she worked more closely with me than some of the others at KI. And I think I always just liked and like her energy uh, she brings to the table and most importantly when things we had moments that were really really difficult and we did not know you know is this can we make it happen you know we had many moments of doubts and I always felt Manon was just very very positive and she always sort of even in sort of the darkest moments she's like we can do it and she added you know her humor and and um, positive attitude to the project that convinced me again and sort of let's continue and that's I think was really a very important contribution uh, that Manon made and continues to make so. <laughs> and uh, through Bala Well I think Thiru you know uh, he's our um, anchor on the ground in Geneva he's uh, you know has helped us build relationships with delegates I think that was he played just an enormously important role he's friends and very much respected by many of the delegates and that allowed KI but also other civil society players to actually develop a relationship and work with delegates and sort of work with them in moving this agenda forward and that's another sort of group of people I think we should not forget it's the delegates um, from the Global South that I think from the very beginning believed, um, shared our vision for reforming global intellectual property rules, including copyright, and you know, then believed in this specific project, the Treaty for the Visually Impaired. And I think without them, uh, Latin American governments, uh, but also India, Nigeria and others, you know, we, we would not be here today. So I think they just played an equally important role in convincing the EU and US that this is the treaty we need and nothing else. And I think it's a lot thanks to their brilliant negotiating skills and commitment that we're here today. Yeah, I don't think they would have had a treaty without the developing countries. Yes, That's for yes. Sure. Yeah. And, and their <laughs> negotiating skills, I think they're, yeah, that was really important. Uh, this morning we were, I was talking to David Hammerstein about the negotiation about image in my mind that you have uh, uh, the, the European Union represented by a you know, lead negotiator, the United States government represented by a lead negotiator, and then you have Mr. Raghavan from India, you'd have Mokhtar from Egypt, you'd have uh, Sarah from Morocco, you'd have Ruth from Nigeria, you'd have the South African uh, negotiators, you'd have Lewis representing Ecuador. Not, not only Lewis, but uh, you have uh, the Chile delegation, you have Kenneth on behalf mm. of Brazil of, uh, and, and Marcus in Brazil. And I was just trying to imagine uh, the dynamics uh, and the 
Mexican negotiators. I was just trying to imagine the dynamics of the negotiation of, of the United States and Europe interfacing with so many talented uh, negotiators uh, uh, from these these countries and how how that uh, how that how that is you know it is if you take stock of things today significantly different dynamic than maybe what you would have seen ten years ago. Yes, I th and that's what I meant. I think it's the negotiating skills of these very highly skilled diplomats, but it's also the technical depth and expertise they had. Because if you look at the final text, it's endlessly complex, and we're still, you know, trying to fully understand what it means in practice. Uh, so I think um, it's really also due to their deep technical expertise that they were able to push back hard on the UN/US. I think that played a really, really um, important role and you know this is this is a multilateral negotiation which is very different from a bilateral one because you're having different people you sort of are talking to and I think the UN US confronted with all these many the ones you just mentioned southern delegates I think um, helped helped our our cause in, in getting a good deal out of it um, I, I'm trying to understand why sort of the text in the end was as good as um, you know it is. It's not perfect, but I think it's a really good outcome. And I think it's due to the brilliance of our f our friends in the governments that have negotiated very hard for this one and not back down. Uh, in part, I think it's probably that the UN/US at some point also said that we cannot so not say no to this treaty, right? And possibly even the industry realizing we cannot kill this treaty because it would be politically um, damaging, right? And I think that was part of why we achieved what we achieved. Before I turn off the camera, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, no, I think I'm, I just want to say, you know, again, that I'm so proud of all the many people that have been involved. And this is the time to celebrate remember Rahul who sort of should be, should have been here with us today and we'll you know everybody will rest uh, and then we'll sort of reconvene and think about next steps and next plans because uh, for the Open Society Foundations and I think for many of the civil society players, players this was you know a first sort of project but this is not the end and I think uh, I hope that in four or five years from now we'll sort of have achieved, you know, uh, a more balanced, uh, uh, really a paradigm shift, I think, in international copyright law. So much more work to be done. <laughs> in my opinion, there would have been absolutely no chance of getting this treaty if it wasn't for you. <laughs> thank you, Jamie. But and thank you, and I, 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 I this is makes me makes me proud. But again, I think, you know, it, it took every one of us. <laughs> 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 took every one of us to, to make this happen. So that's why I say it's, it's an important moment. We should celebrate and, and just enjoy. I think this is, this is really big. <laughs> and thank you again for the vision that you had and inspired, inspired me to sort of believe in it.